Well, good morning. It is another episode of Unpublic with Citizen Stewart. Today is Tuesday, um, so it's one of those kind of like middle child days. It's like uh, like Jan from um, from the Brady Bunch, you know. Um, Friday is Marsha, 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 um, and today is the the Tuesday. It's Jan Day. Uh, I want to start out by saying that. On this show, I actually started Unpublic to start thinking out of the boundaries of what we normally talk about in education to start looking for the good news. Start looking for the places where practice makes a difference, where praxis makes a difference, where ideas and theory make a difference, where the classrooms where, where young people are doing well and beating the odds. The whole goal of this pursuit that I have is to find the achievement gospels, which is the good news around achievement. What is the good news? We hear the bad news all the time. We know what the bad news is. We have the statistical evidence and proof of what the bad news is. Good. So we got it. Now, can somebody come into the room and talk about what might be some of the promising signs and factors? And uh, one, uh, this wasn't a, a fruitless pursuit. This was something I started knowing that for years I've been talking about the belief gap, the gap which is the difference between what our, cap our kids are capable of and what the adults in their lives think that they're capable of. And there's a gap between those two things. Um, and I've th talked about closing that belief gap so that we can get on with the good news of um, of educating children. You know, one last piece to, the, to all of this, this is my setup to, to my conversation today. Um, one last piece of this is educational essentialism in my mind is the belief that if I tell you what the demographics of a child are, then I can predict and just tell you what their life should be in terms of their education. So um, you're poor, you're black, your mom uh, is not married, you don't have two white college educated um, parents, therefore, you should do poorly on standardized tests. You probably won't be in gifted, blah, blah, blah. That is a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy, number one. It's not borne out in the, the stats when you look at, uh, take all uh, two college educated parent white people out of the equation, take them out, take them off, and just look at black kids who have a single black mom, um, for instance, and there's a scatter plot. And some of them will be doing better and some of them won't be doing as well. And then you have to start asking your question, okay, well, that's weird because they're supposed to all be failing. They're supposed to be all doing poorly. What's the difference in this classroom in Charlotte versus this classroom in Atlanta versus this classroom in Minneapolis? It's so weird that the same demographic of child might be doing uh, far better uh, at King uh, uh, Magnet High School in Watts in Los Angeles than, say, you know, a high school in New York that's been failing for years. So let's talk about that. Let's jump right in. My guest today is someone who can really help us um, with this conversation. I don't want to put too much on you, Tangi, or uh, uh, um, let me see, doctor. Should I say doctor? Uh, you can you know, for a you know. moment because it's <laughs> and all that stuff. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Dr. Tangi Reed Marshall uh, is the director of uh, P12 practice at the Education Trust, one of my favorite organizations. Uh, I have followed the edu uh, Education Trust for years because they used to put out these beating the odds um, um, PowerPoints. And maybe 10, 12, 13 years ago, I... I just found it was like for me it was the good news because I, I was on a school board i got one of these uh powerpoints and it just had all the stats on specific schools that were doing really well and i was able to go to my school board and say see it is it's possible. possible stop right. talking about this it's not right. possible so prior to joining ed trust uh tangi worked with the office of academic programs at virginia polytechnic institute uh, and the state uh university to prepare the school of education accreditation with the council for the accreditation of education preparation which is a big um part of the the puzzle that we talk about here all the time is teacher yeah. prep how are we preparing your people? But before that, actually, you did work, uh, Tangi, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but I think it's important <laughs> well, for this discussion, you. you know, in Charlotte, Mecklenburg, which I do it today in this conversation at this point, want to talk about some of the things that were put in place in Charlotte, because we always talk about Charlotte, Mecklenburg as an integration success story, but we don't talk about the fact that that district pulled its teachers aside at some point and rethought some of the how they educate, not just mixing students up, but they also did some technical work. So welcome, 
Tanji, thank you for being on this morning. I appreciate you. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm not quite sure what it feels like to be like the Jan day. So hope that wasn't like, <laughs> ah, I'm the Jan day. What does that actually mean? <laughs> you know, it's it a means pleasure to be here. You have a harder lift. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, All right. On, on Friday, everybody's happy, you know. On That's Friday. right, because it's Happy oh. Friday. It's Freedom Friday um, when you got Sharif al Mecki on Fridays, which is always a great thing. So I would ask you, you you have a podcast that you do with Karen Chenoweth called Extraordinary Districts. You've come to the last episode of that uh, for the season. Just ask you what in that maybe series of discussions that you had that gave you the signal through the noise, like the the thing that you think is hopeful, a hopeful sign of what's going on in education that makes you feel like we still should be hopeful that we can have achieving students. That's right. I think what was so interesting about doing that podcast with Karen one, because she's just brilliant and, and she's so thoughtful about this idea of achievement and leadership and what the nugget for me, and I've always known that leadership matters, right? Because you can't run buildings without strong leadership, but Karen's take on it was really important. And so listening to those various leaders talk about the need to be thoughtful and how and how precise they were being regarding what was necessary to open buildings, what was necessary to rethink the process of educating students was, I think, for me, one of the most important pieces. And then we talked a lot. We spent a lot of time this season talking about reading um, because reading matters and everybody needs to know how to read. And we had some great voices about reading on the show. We kicked it off with Dr. Alfred Tatum, who if mm. you are, don't know Alfred Tatum, and I know that you do, but if your listeners do not know him, he is somebody to, to really listen to because he says this thing that all texts belong to all kids. And he is in this fight for the literacy of the lives of young people with a particular focus on African-American males. And that's crucial, right? This idea that literacy is about liberation for your life um, and advanced levels of literacy. And this idea that, you know what? We now know that the data shows every single kid can learn how to read. Like the misnomer that some kids can't is complete fallacy. And there are small pockets, like really small pockets of students who may struggle with the, with the processing of reading and learning how to do it. But we know now through lots of voices, lots of data, that every single kid can learn how to read. And the principals and building and district leaders and teachers we spoke to all echoed that. Like they really, really echoed this notion that they know that every kid can learn how to read. Um, so that was a big, big deal for me. So What's the important. barrier? What's the thing that's stopping? If we know that every kid can read, but we also know that there's hardly a place in the United States where reading proficiency gets above 19% for black students, what's the uh, block? What's the problem? The problem is not everybody knows that, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. you have, there, there are pockets of pl pockets and places where people actually don't know and they're following what feels like good reading, but is not good reading practice, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, I, I put, a, I had an article in the BET online earlier in the year. Um, and I asked this question, not in BT, it was in um, a, um, a leadership magazine and I asked this question, do you want every kid to learn how to read? Basic question. Every single person is going to say yes. Well, if yes is your answer, then does every single kid in your district, in your building, know how to do it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you know what your strategies are where kids are learning how to do that thing called reading? And people will say, well, we're using this program. We're using this program. Reading is a systematic process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Programs can support it but programs should not be the driving force behind the reason why a kid can or cannot read. So do the educators in the building understand and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that every single child can acquire the skill of learning how to read something. Mm -hmm. And if that, and if they don't, then you got to go back to the drawing board and you got to ask yourself, you brought up the belief gap. If you say, you know that, all right, well then you know that. 
then how come it's not happening? Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. And you got, you got to really, you've got to be willing as a leader from the top to the bottom, be getting in there, looking at what teachers are doing, figuring out our kids learning how to do it because they yeah. can do it. And if so, you're not doing that, then like you gotta, you gotta, you have a fiduciary responsibility to the taxpayers, to parents. You know, mm-hmm. I used to, when I was in the classroom, I was never absent. Right. And my kids were like, Marshall, can you please just be absent? I was like, nope. <laughs> I'm like, nope, because the taxpayers pay yeah. me to come yeah. here. Yeah. You know? And so that's a responsibility. And I don't know. No, I do know. Not every single teacher, despite what they say, absolutely holds to the belief that every kid can. I think that is um, that is borne out in the research. So when we research teachers and we look at their attitudes about um, children of color, I say it all the time. So every day, uh, black Americans are doing something that no other race is doing. We are handing our babies over to an entirely different race of people to educate our children. And oh, out of all the people that we could pick, we're handing them over to the group of people <laughs> that have a history of not seeing us for the best that we can be, huh. right? Right, so right, right. And we that, hand, you know. yeah, and we hand them over to the group of people whose ancestors systematically constructed and designed and orchestrated mm-hmm. and implemented a process mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. illiteracy. Disbelief. Of, of disbelief, disbelief yes. right? They use wow. science. They use like they they orchestrated wow. this whole system around that, and so it's very difficult to dislodge inbred misconceptions. Yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's just really hard to do that. I'm mean, an article came out in Educational Leadership uh, earlier in the year. I think at the end of last year that really talked about teach white teachers in particular hold the same level of bias against mm-hmm. black students as the general public. Mm-hmm. That would make okay. sense too, right? Right, yeah, right. Because no, they're part no. of the general public. And no. these are from people who choose education. I don't know you, mm-hmm. I've listened to you talk about, you don't like read, you haven't like, you didn't like reading in school or well, there's a book mm-hmm. called the giver. And your listeners who no, are, no, uh, I want to say, uh, I love the giver. reading. Okay. I didn't like, School. <laughs> I got it. I got I it. There, reading. That distinction matters. So, so you know what? That's I will right. say this much too, and I That's want because right. re- reading is so important. Yeah. And and autodidacts and and uh, self determined reading and self directed reading, all of those things were big in my life um, mm. because. I grew up in a family of re- when you wanted to know to do something, there was no internet. So I grew up with family members that would always have a book, regardless of their level of education, like regardless of whether they right. went to, to college or not, either that or a magazine. But I will okay. say this much um, for me, the American public education or public library system was a better public uh, educational service than the schools were in my own life. I'm just talking about right. me. Your own life. Yeah. yeah. So the reading part to me, um, um, I still push to people whether whatever you're doing in school, it should you should be able to learn to read in the United you should, States. You, you should. should be able to, to learn and, to read. And these are teachers who, and I say that because we don't live in the time of the giver. Nobody mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. forcing you to become an educator. And mm-hmm. so if you choose to do this thing that inherent to its practice is the belief in the intellectual capacity of those you have the honor and privilege to teach and encounter, then you have a responsibility to teach them. Mm. But you still have large pockets of white teachers who do not believe that black children, particularly black children, have the intellectual capacity to do high level work. Now, many years ago, the Ed Trust did a study on assignments, and then uh, they had this great quote from a young lady. She was in an AP English class, and she said, you know, we're reading The Hunger Games, and she had seen some colleagues, some of her peers, reading The Odyssey. And she said, I love The Hunger Games, but I know that I'm going to be taking the AP English test, Mm. and I'm not going to be prepared, but they're going to be prepared because they're reading the Odyssey and I'm not, right? And then the uh, TNTP in 2018 came out with a study called the Opportunity Myth. And Mm -hmm. they saw, they saw the disparities between what teacher expectations were having on black children. 
who by and large got less rigorous work than their white peers, who were called on less in classroom, whose work was accepted at a subpar level, they, there you go, right? Yeah. I mean, it's huge, like this is huge and this is 20, and, and here's the interesting thing, Chris, you ask a teacher what they believe about kids and they will tell you, I believe every kid can learn. But honestly, you can walk into a classroom pre-pandemic and within 30 seconds, you will know what a teacher believes about the kids sitting in front of them just by who, where the kids are seated, who gets called on, how the teacher gives wait time to them, what the teacher, what kinds of questions the teacher asks which students, which students asks questions. There's a whole observational process that can unlock teacher bias in less than a minute. So I, I do, so I wanna go hard on this one point because I do think there's a difference between what people do individually and what systems do to make people do things. So, um, so first of all, I wanna say, stop here and just, say that we say white teachers, but black teachers within systems um, oftentimes respond the same way that white teachers do with low um, low expectations or, you know, so we have research that says if you have a black You're teacher right. that you do better in, in a lot of cases, but we also have entire school districts like the Atlanta Public Schools, for yeah. instance, mm -hmm. that had an entire kind of bougie breakout where that's they right. had very, very low expectations, black that's teachers, right. that's very right. low, but that was a system. It wasn't just mm -hmm. individual actions. We have to talk about systems. systems. Like, that's right. Because every American, every German, every whoever you are, whatever country, you live within the context of a system and where you put the street lights, for instance, determine that's right. how you drive left or right. That's right. So that we can correct. blame individual drivers for their bad driving, or we could blame the fact that your, your street lights go off in confusing patterns sometimes. That is uh, correct. You know, so when I look at this thing you just mentioned, the opportunity myth, I wanted to pull it up. So anybody listening or watching, please just Google the opportunity myth. TNTP is the new teacher project that did mm -hmm. it. And there's like systemic things here to me, like it, this one, th these should be damning headlines. Four out of 10 <laughs> classrooms with the mm -hmm. majority of students of color never received yeah. a single grade level assignment. Assignment, right? Like, like, like what that mean? like, right, right. But that, that wow. right there, in terms of the systemic nature of that, that is a system whereby the leadership does not have a process in place to analyze quality of assignments in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then they're not looking at how assignments are distributed across the landscape of mm -hmm. their district, right? So, and, and you can talk about the degree to which building leaders are instructional leaders. Mm -hmm. and so that's a leadership like construct and paradigm that also has to be talked about. But the system level there, because the system, will, the, the leaders in the system will say, all of our teachers know what grade level assignments are and we have an expectation that every kid gets them. However, in the building, across the grade, in the classroom, you still have this uneven distribution of who gets what, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you also have this interesting dynamic where grading inequities play a huge part whereby if I'm a black child, my assignment quality might be lower, but my grade might be higher because mm. you've got this like weird, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. interesting notion that, well, this is all I'm good at. I, this is my level. Mm -hmm. and it's my level. Mm -hmm. So I have topped out at my level. So I'm I'm being graded against the person's belief system about what I'm capable of. So they will overgrade as opposed to give the right kind of feedback to help me actually meet the grade I've been quote unquote given versus that which I earned, mm -hmm. which is a very mm -hmm. different thing. And that's also systemic, right? Because there's no process in place to look at what it means for the kid to get that quote unquote A or B or mastery or whatever, 
right? It's a system level processing that has to be in place to look at that, right? Um, which is and when you really say system in place, are you thinking there are all these layers to that? So is there like a state level to that, a district level to that, and a building level to that? Or is that mostly what happens in a building? It's mostly what happens in a building because, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, the state has standards, right? The state has their standards, the state has their testing, but the sort of living out of it all happens at the building level. And mm -hmm. so a building and district. So those are going to be mm -hmm. sort of those lines of um, authority, right? Um, and sort of the lines and the structures in place that have to happen. But it's it's really tricky, Chris. You know, mm -hmm. this idea of who believes what. And you brought up the Atlanta issue. People don't talk about the way in which we, as Black educators, help that system do those really damaging things to our kids. Um, mm -hmm. And that that's important to talk about, too. Because like how, had, like, what would you think would be one of the ways that that happened? That they help what, it happen, I think you know? the, the way that they help it is in, in through this under, this belief that if I'm a black teacher, I might be educated, but if I'm living or teaching in a quote unquote under-resourced, economically distressed neighborhood, am I adopting the domain, the dominant culture's perspectives about the students I teach. Do mm -hmm. I subscribe to poor black kid? Let me, you know, come in as the savior or am I actually educating students in accordance to what is necessary? Right. Now I you think hitting like, on something. Now you hitting I'm, on something you, that's you, provocative. Yeah, I doc. know. You're like, <laughs> well, you no, saw the no. thread. You saw no, no, this is where I think is provocative about it is that I do think we give a free pass. You know, for white educators, we have all the energy in the world to say that you are participating in a system of at least discrimination, but possibly a system of white supremacy. When we come to black educators, oftentimes we uh, give a, a free pass in a lot of ways on the same thing without Let's get critical. Let's just think about critical theory on some things sometimes. So um, the number of black people that actually have your credentials um, mm -hmm. is is like less than 1%. Yeah, it's right? about right. 0.9, 0. 0.7, 0.9. Yeah, it's a very mm -hmm. small percentage. Um, with lesser than your credentials, but still the credentials that it goes beyond college. So mm -hmm. what it would take to be a teacher, if you are a black educator, mm -hmm. you are amongst a group of people that are still within a small percentage of black people, right? right? So when you walk into a middle class institution, because let's be real, that's what schools are. They are mi middle class governed institutions um, that at times are at war with the underclass and working class people in them. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so, so you can be black in Chicago as an educator and be bougie as hell and be bringing in the same kind of um, anti-black or internalized right. racism ideas right. about students Absolutely. into the classroom. We don't talk about it much, but Atlanta is a good example, um, and so is Chicago mm -hmm. and a few other yeah. places. And parts of New York, too, though. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah. I, sometimes adopting that principle of anti-Blackness mm -hmm. becomes a survival mechanism mm -hmm. that allows mm -hmm. you this, like, space to fit into a construct, right? I was... Um, adjuncting for American University a while back. And I had a I had a, a student and she was talking about her students, her own students. And she came out and she said, well, you know, I teach kids, I teach third graders from Southeast DC. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I remember cringing when she said it. And I remember asking her to stay after class. And I <laughs> asked her, <laughs> she was called to the principal's office, right? I asked her, to stay after class. And we had a very frank conversation about what that sentiment meant and how damaging it was for that, for her to one, hold that sentiment as a black teacher. And number two, um, how impactful it was to her interactions with her students, because she was holding on to this idea that being a third grader from Southeast DC was pejorative and it meant something negative. And so she had to, she had adopted the pervading framework about that section of DC and what the students in that DC represented, in that portion of DC represented. And it was very hard for her throughout the semester 
because I just would hammer and hammer and hammer away at her comments, at you know her lessons because they were very low level. I mean, it was a fight like every week. Um, so yeah, we have to be as diligent and vigilant in dislodging that. It's a very conscious um, body of work that as a black teacher, if you have stepped into that ideology, you've got to work doubly hard because you do this thing whereby you have low expectations, but you are holding kids to this um, very, very high standard. And sometimes it's about the mirror of yourself and how far you might or might not be removed from the economic status of the students in front of you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes mm -hmm. you adopt that framework to to give yourself some distance, which is damaging, mm -hmm. you know? And again, you, you then step into this disenfranchising power mechanism that is really harmful to kids. Wow. Um, so, so we know that the system is broken, that the mindset- No, no, it's not, no, it's not broken. No, no, no. Mm -mm. You're going to say it's working exactly the way it was designed Come on, to work. Chris, you know that. <laughs> like, stop it. This is it's not a broken, a broken system. It's, not, it's broken by design in the sense that- Okay, but that, I will say this then. Let me clear it up. Thank um, you. It's a broken system in this way to me. If it's supposed to be a system of education, you know, as a system of miseducation, it's working very well. Okay. As a system, of, as a system of miseducation, it's doing its job. We have people storming the Capitol who believe that Hillary Clinton is running a pedo ring out of a people. <laughs> I know, parlor. I can't. And, and, I and can't. the majority of all those people actually came out of public schools. Uh, so it's possible for um, it's possible for um, um, public schools to be a moron factory and create a million <laughs> moron march on the Capitol, right? So, ouch, so yes, ouch, so so, ouch. so yes, it's working in that way, that we still have people who never read a book after high school, that we still have Americans who can't name the Supreme Court justices or tell you what the Supreme Court does. Yes, that's we still right. have that, that we have uh, people in the United States, if you stop them cold on the street, like many late night TV comedy shows have done and <laughs> ask them basic questions about the structure of their government, they will get it wrong. Get it. They will, they will right. look like deer in the headlights. But if that's you ask right. them the latest uh, Demi Lovato song, they they'll can name like eight, right? Yeah, they'll know it. Uh, and as a matter of fact, Demi is actually old to them now like they're, they can even tell you the ones the new that's ones right. of the moment that's right? right that's right um um can't probably name a single Aretha franklin song no. um yeah, so, they can name one they can name one yeah probably what respect you of know course. Uh, but on, they can't no. spell it no they cannot <laughs> anyway. no no don't start the spelling yeah, oh no right. we're not spelling so this is what i'll say the system's working in that way but in the way that it's not working is that um Education, as I understand it, as a person from the outside, is a a system of 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 sets of activities like uh, and thinking, planning, um, scope and sequence, the way that you deliver curriculum, the pacing, what what works and what doesn't. Like we've tried these programs. You said just something earlier in this conversation that, that you know it's not just about programs. Like there's some other stuff, you know, before you get there. But this is what I wanted to get to. We know the problems. We know the system is broken in ways. I say it on this show all the time about like the science of reading, you know. So in Minneapolis, I'll give you just a quick, for instance, they kicked out a reading program that was known to be scientifically wrong, that it just doesn't work, that it's terrible. They got it kicked out. Somebody, you know, we had active parents and, and a few educators who were like, pay attention. There's something called the science of reading. And guess what? It's, it's still employed in the district right next door in St. Paul, <laughs> the twin cities. You know, this, this is the twin cities. Minneapolis kicks it out. St. Paul is like, that looks good. Um, anyways, what I want to get to is the, the good news. So this is all the bad news, but, um, you know, education trusts used to put out these things kind of like dispelling the myth. Right. Mm -hmm. And I used to love it because it was more around um, show me schools that are doing better in this. Right. Um, and and you're at, you know, at trust. Now, I just I'm, I'm going to put up on the screen something I wrote a few years back um, that was based on some stuff from Ed trust. So this is 2015. So this is six years ago. Mm -hmm. Says I don't believe in miracles. Um, I believe in kids. And I had put out a tweet about George Hall Elementary School that was 99% black, 98% student poverty, and all proficient. Um, you're not ready for this discussion until you believe in our kids. 
I didn't think that that was a provocative tweet, but that was a provocative tweet. Immediately, Gary Rubenstein of internet <laughs> fame, internet fame, and Diane Ravitch and a few other people just seized on it. And, you know, they were like debunking the miracle stories. That 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 was their purpose. They basically said, we want to debunk these miracle school th theories, which to me made it so clear that they didn't even think it was possible. Like it, to them, it would take a miracle. It would take like Jesus turning water into wine to get a black child to in, in Alabama to read right. well. Um, and so I had used Ed Trust's uh, information and there were other schools, Mary McLeod Bethune, uh, Bethune Elementary in New Orleans, uh, um, Charles Drew Charter School in Georgia. These weren't all one kind of schools. These were district schools, charter, they were different kinds. So, um, so I only lift that up for two reasons. Number one, to say that the belief gap is real because people, when I, I wrote this, what was seemingly innocuous article about let's celebrate when people get things right. But I think the reason that they think it's a miracle is because they don't know how to do it. So what do you know about like when educators at George Hall and others come together to rethink what they're doing and they're teaching? To, give me some insights on the mechanics of what they're doing because it isn't miracles. They're not right. sitting around saying, hey, let's like, you know, dream about no, things. No, you're not. No. And I will say that the DTM work was before my time at Ed Trust, but here's what I know about the systematic practice and process. You have a group of teachers led by thoughtful, strong leadership who are looking at data and learning that, you know what? Our students are not performing at the level that we believe they should, that the state requires that they need to be. We are not making this a factor of student race, culture, or family dynamics. What we are doing is saying, what are we doing right now? Somebody give us some information about what are we doing right now? What have we tried that may work? And they're going through the systematic incremental process of trial and error. It sounds boring, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and it sounds tedious and it is all of those things, but it is fascinating. Um, Dr. Tim Shanahan talks about, you know, doing what's right by reading, what's right by kids is an incremental process. They are looking at current practice and they're going through the redesign process to make sure that they deeply understand what has worked, what needs to continue and what they need to remove so that what kids need to do gets done. That's the work, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the very, very hard grind day in, day out work of teaching. Sometimes teaching is just not sexy. <laughs> I think most times probably teaching is just not sexy. You know what I'm saying? But like yeah. that, that, that's the process. You have a leader yeah. who has looked at their data, right? Data mm -hmm. matters. One of the things that, you know, you brought up what Ed Trust does with all those slides, it is grounded in data. What, what do kind we of data? Know? What's the student data that you think is important? Okay. And when you say student achievement, what's student achievement data? It's their outcomes based upon their state tests. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and sometimes it's looking at their, if the state's part, like their NAEP scores as well, right? Mm -hmm, that they, mm -hmm. Those kinds of pieces. We look at what kids are in what classes. Do kids have equal equitable access to high, to advanced coursework? And mm -hmm. when do they get it? You know, when is, you know, my kids went to both public and private school. Um, by seventh grade, both my kids had had algebra. By eighth grade, both my kids had had geometry. Ninth grade, they walked in able to take algebra two. They topped out at calculus. Mm, wow. And, yeah. and they topped out at calculus in the 11th grade. Yeah, yeah. Because there's nothing left, right? Yeah. But, they, but I was a parent who knew those things, right? So I understood that piece. But like the data that we look at, we look at what are the achievement rates by the state standards, right? Because our states have standards and take their tests. We look at who's in what classes. We look at the discipline numbers, who's mm -hmm. getting disciplined mm -hmm. by way of in-school suspension, out-of-school suspension, if schools are tracking the difference between the two, mm -hmm. right? We're looking at um, absenteeism, right? Are kids coming to school? 
So kids and teacher absenteeism. Yeah, I don't know if we, I don't know if they looked at teacher absenteeism okay. um, in those studies. I don't know that for sure, mm -hmm. but that's mm -hmm. a critical factor too. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you got to look at like, do your teachers come to school? Like I told you, my kids are like, Marshall, please just be absent. I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, don't they're come like, in. <laughs> that's why, like, can you please just be yeah. out? Just not be here. No, yeah. that's a driver. If I'm here, I'm here every day, 180 days. So right? um, when you, so, Oftentimes we get caught up in the the testing debate about the tests uh, themselves as instruments, have to defend sometimes the use of them, they're biased, they're racist, they don't tell us much, they tell us too little, too late, you know, all of the things that to me don't make any sense, but, you know, I'm not a doctor. So, so <laughs> doc, tell me, ah. like, tell me how you can um, lift up that as one of other factors, but yeah. as, as an important factor. Um, without encountering that same level of pushback on those as measures. I get pushback all the time on that. And here's my question. And here's what I say to people. Mm -hmm. You cannot work at McDonald's if you cannot pass their math test. Mm. They won't hire you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if McDonald's cares about your ability to do basic math, mm -hmm. why are we pushing back against kids demonstrating whether or not we taught them how to do the basic math McDonald's expects. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's one thing. Um, people ask me about standards all the time and they give me this, you know, the common core standards and they were racist and they're this or they're that. And I tell people all the time, well, okay, all right, fine. Do me a favor. I want you to read the standards. Tell me which one a child mm -hmm. should not be able to do. Pick it and then That's take it out. Kind of my response every single time that. Pick so, the one. So, Pick you know, out the one that you don't um, want. I say this with for parents too, parents listening. I you if you have watched me any amount of time as a parent, I have said, go ahead and pull up your state's sample tests because they yeah. they publish the sample tests. They so you can go look at yourself. So instead of listening to other people argue, and especially your educators, who I think just really it's suspicious, it's hella sus. <laughs> it's suspicious <laughs> that, that educators are the ones who are like, Yeah, nah, we don't need no third party testing. It's evil. Oh, yeah, that third party taste testing is racist. We're totally not racist, but those tests are like, tests are racist. Racist. you know, yeah, right. take, right, those right, tests right. are racist, boy. Don't, oh, don't yeah. go looking in that racism closet. <laughs> uh, 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 you're and, in trouble now. You know, well, I mean, <laughs> uh, because we're anti science people sometimes. Yeah. Don't tell me that you think that the test is racist because it has a question on it you don't like. I'm going to need you as a non psychometrician to go ahead and start there explaining to me why the entire test is, is something we That's just, right. You know, we and, push and, and, and here's the pushback on that, too, Chris. So then I ask people this question too. Do you know how to drive? So I'm gonna ask you, do you know how to drive? And I do. Okay. Do very you fast. have very fast? Me too. <laughs> yeah. My husband threatened to take my car away because I kept getting too many <laughs> tickets, but that's another conversation. Um, do you have a driver's license? I have a driver's license, yes. How did yeah. you get your driver's license? Um wow. So my first one, which was years ago. Did you take a test to get it? I had to take for my first one. I had to take a test, and then after that, I think I just got renewed with. That's small right. Tests. Yeah, yeah. But your yeah. very first one, you had to take a test, right? That's right. That's right. So was the yeah. is that a standardized test that you took to get your driver's license? Um, it felt a little arbitrary. I took it in San Francisco with a 1972 Grand Torino, which was one of them long boat oh, no. cars. Yes. And the guy who this had me on scary. it was telling me, he was like, turn left, like right before I was supposed to turn. <laughs> right. Turn right in that's San right. Francisco of all places. You know, with right, you can't do that. The hills, and the, and that's right. And, that's and right. Then forget about the parking job because you have to park, right? Parallel you know, park, not just parallel, parking, parallel, parallel park. park. Um, but I will say this much. That's my own kind of a side and tangent. I took it again in San Jose, I think. And uh, that was much more um, standardized and what, what it was supposed to be, what I studied for. Well, you I actually studied, studied for, for it. it. Yeah, I studied right. for it. You took a test, yeah. right? Yeah. And so right. you took a racist standardized test to get your That's driver's right. license. Mm -hmm. That's right. And if tests are racist, and I'm not going to argue whether they are or are not. We have found that in the SAT in particular, that there are structures in it the way questions are analyzed and viewed that there are structures that favor certain races versus others based upon the rigor of a question. We found that they've found it in the SAT. It's there. Okay. Just stop there for a second though. One second on that point, mm -hmm. did we find that it favors certain races 
or did we find because of certain like like I don't think that there's anything that says genetically speaking this is a test mm, that favors right, a right. genetics. That's right. This, that's, it's this not favors, genetically. Yeah. No, it favors the condition of a person. That's right. Exactly right. And those right. conditions are associated with races. That's right. That so the right. question itself may not like I've heard the example yeah. of the difference mm -hmm. between a bucket and a pail. Right. So you wouldn't know the difference between a bucket and a pail because you know you call it a bucket and I call and, it a pail and I can't make and it, I can't make it. Yeah, yeah, I can make a distinction. That's right. Yeah, yeah but you no, what I'm talking about are like what, what, what I'm talking about are things like um, high inferential questions versus more rote questions. Okay, like that like, okay. real like nitty gritty psychometrician stuff in there like you talked about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But like, do we say the same thing about doctors passing their state boards? Those yeah. are standardized tests. Or attorneys, you know. Or, or exactly. Yeah. Do we yeah. say the same things about attorneys? Do you want to go to the doctor who felt mm -hmm. really, really good about medical school but did not pass their boards? Like, mm -hmm. is that the one you go to? No. Mm -hmm. You know, and, uh, and I laugh about this, you know, and I've said this, you know, in public places. I had two children. I had 26 hours of collective labor. I had four epidurals and I had two C-sections. I don't care how my doctor felt about the scalpel. I yeah. don't care. Yeah, I yeah. wanted to know that she knew which one to pick up and ask for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's all I cared about. Like, and I want her to feel good about her practice, but I want her to be a master of her craft. You right? right. And like kids understand that they go to school to learn stuff and to learn how to do stuff. Mm -hmm. Like they know that and their achievement matters to them and they get really bothered by those cool teachers who are cool, but don't teach them stuff. And they, they know, know it. Kids aren't dumb. And they, they know, know kids are not dumb. They know yeah, it. They, like know they it. understand that. And so like we need assessments so that parents and kids and educators know what's happening. Right. We can argue about the merits of the No Child Left Behind bill from here, you know, every day, all day and twice on Sunday for good measure. But what we learned from them was the systematic under and miseducation of black children. When that onion came out and we kept pulling those layers back, we saw some stuff. Yeah. Right. And it forced actions that are necessary. And so when people tell me I don't want to be I don't want my kids tested. I cry foul. I was in the classroom for a long time. I wanted my kids tested all the time. And I've been saying it over the last two or three weeks. I so, wanted, I heard know, you talk about it. You know, I wanted my I students just did tested. It. We opted in. So this year, the district sent us an email basically saying this year, um, all testing that the annual testing is completely optional. And, and you could tell in the tone of the letter, the email, it was, <laughs> you totally don't have to take it. And mm -hmm. it was like, it won't affect your school at all if mm -hmm. you don't take it and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, so this is this is just like, you know, it's going to be a bad year because we're just not going to want to, you know, to like do it or whatever. We get there. So the the reading one, you know, we got there just in time uh, to be in line and whatnot. And we expected to waltz right in. Lines coming out the door. So parents actually showing up to have their kids opt into testing. And I'm like, oh, damn. Okay. <laughs> and I'm looking at who the parents are. And the parents were every shade and every hue. Um, from, know. from immigrant parents to, you know, Somali parents to mm -hmm. uh, those those kind of good, you know, farm parents. We have like a mix here, you know, so that the rural uh, mm -hmm. whatnot, they're all showing up. And, they and there was, know. there's a winner's <laughs> ideology at, at play here. These people are a little bit like they show up for their doctor appointments, whatnot. All the stereotypes, because we don't live in a rich district. So all the stereotypes right. that you would have about people totally fell apart because and then Saturday, same thing. This last Saturday, they did the math portion. Right. Uh, same thing. Kids show up or whatever. I'm like thinking, wow, these parents are actually opting in to the test this year um, that the district probably doesn't want them to take. So anyways, let's let's jump from this a little bit to are there hot spots? Are there places where you look at a district or a school or a set of educators and you think, yes, that's what good looks like? Or this is at least a group that is taking it from a science perspective and trying to rethink the system part rather than. Yeah than talking about the political stuff or whatever. That's right. And and, I, and it's really hard to dislodge the two, right? Yeah, because all yeah. education is political. Um, I had an opportunity to d support some uh, folks in the state of Delaware and listen in on um, some folks in New Mexico who are really 
and, and in Rhode Island as well, really grappling with how to restructure learning, how to ensure that the teachers that they currently have are well-trained and that the teachers coming into the district have the kinds of um, preparation and knowledge base that are gonna best educate their children. Um, really been able to listen to smart leaders, really asking the right kinds of questions, really trying to um, get to the essence of what it means from a state level so that they can then help districts within their states really do some, some really important hard work. Um, so that was New Mexico, that was Rhode Island, that was Delaware. I've also been able to, um, I have a heart for Charlotte Mecklenburg school systems who continues to really, <clears throat> excuse me, really ask themselves the tough questions about what does it mean to put forth the right kind of curriculum? What does it mean to put forth strong teachers? How do we do this in mm -hmm. such a big ocean liner of a district, right? Yeah, because you know, with Charlotte <laughs> Mecklenburg, I, I said earlier, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. They popped up on my radar a um, few years back and I couldn't find the article before this interview. I was looking for it. And it was, it was interesting to me that Charlotte had a lot going on in terms of desegregation. And I had always heard about it as a desegregation story and district. And in looking into that, I found this one article that was about the educators who, when they were doing the desegregation work, had come together to think through, rethink teaching and learning. And, and it was overshadowed by the desegregation story because honestly, the real work was, if we're going teaching. to do desegregation, we gotta think we gotta of teach. teaching. Yeah, that's right. You so, gotta and teach I asked some kids. of my integration <laughs> friends, some of my friends that are all in the integration stuff, like, did you guys pay attention to the pedagogical work that they were doing alongside the desegregation? And they're like, yeah, yeah, poo poo, whatever, you know, yeah, yeah. All we gotta do is mix the kids up. You know, we just gotta like yeah. make sure to. I was like, no, that's not the story there. Do not you? The story. What, what was the insight the that you had on the on the story, like on the pedagogical side? What was some of the stuff you noticed there that I they think were working on? For me, when I got there, a lot of it's funny because I keep entering these spaces as the movements have already uh, gone underway. But I will tell <laughs> yeah. you, right? Yeah. So I think, and I actually got to, I had the pleasure of teaching one of the daughter, one of the granddaughters of the family who brought the who brought the lawsuit against the district. Um, mm -hmm. But what they did was really step back a moment and look at how teachers were teaching. I, I underwent as a new teacher coming into the district, a lot of professional development around what does it mean to teach? And we were talking about teaching for cultural relevance before the term caught fire. Um, and that was a long time ago, right? So the term caught fire and here we all are. But what we were looking at and asking ourselves questions about was literally, how do you do it? You know, how do you, how do you take, you know, how do you really look at the sort of black box of instructional practices through a critical lens. And by cri critical lens, I mean a lens that offers you the ability to deeply interrogate what you do from point A to point B, from like bell to bell, right? Mm -hmm. How do you structure movement? What do we know about the need for shifts within the practice cycle, the learning cycle? What do we mean by way of assignment? What do we mean by way of how to communicate with different parents, right? Because Latin um, Hispanic parents have a different structure of communication than say African American parents and say white parents. You know, it's interesting if you do a parent teacher conference with a black family, you may just get mom, dad, other caregivers. If you do the same structure with a um, Hispanic family, you might get everybody, mm -hmm. right? How, mm -hmm. how do you honor mm -hmm. that and not take a deficit lens to that and really begin to interrogate our thinking around what it meant to interact with families how did we understand the cycle of sort of teaching itself? How do we understand the cycle of information flow within buildings? How do we understand what does it mean to evaluate assignments and look at kids, you know, in a very, very um, sort of direct way? How do we understand 
when a child is meeting a standard or not meeting a standard, right? And mm -hmm. so I think those are those kinds of questions that you that we were at, I was asked to look at coming into the district, which which spoke to the kind of work that preceded me and then lived throughout my time there. What are some things that you thought about? I see Mama Toya here says, talk more about that. And I think she's talking specifically about the family, mm -hmm. how you communicate with family part. And uh, I always think that it's important for us to say a little bit about the homeschool relationship. Yeah. Because uh, as a parent, I don't always feel like the district is preparing me to do my best job. So did you find anything unique about yeah. the communication yeah, with parents? I did because when I worked in, uh, before I got to CMS, I was in New Jersey and New Jersey is a union state and North mm -hmm. Carolina is not. So in New Jersey, mm -hmm. if I sneezed five minutes past the bell, that was a union thing, right? And they had, <laughs> they had to come across and pay me for that, right? Like they, they took the teacher time very, you know, seriously, but in CMS, we had to do things like have our, our school open house on a Sunday, that would never happen in a, in a union state because we wouldn't be allowed to do that, right? Mm -hmm. we, we were expected to do things like bus duty and lunch duty and after school duty. That would never happen in, an, in a union state. Um, in terms of parent communication, we had specific timetables. We were asked to be sure that we kept, you know, and this is pretty standard, but we were, it was more um, the, the accountability around it, I think, was tighter and higher in CMS than in other places where I had worked in terms of how often you communicate with parents, how many, how many ways you communicated with parents. You were expected to communicate with parents in a multiplicity of ways, not just, oh, well, I call them and no one answered. Mm -hmm. That was not acceptable. Um, you had to really <clears throat> figure out what was the best avenue to partner with parents for on behalf of their students. Hmm. I feel like that there's a science to this that actually is going to get better over time. For a long time, we did the, you know, the kind of bake sale stuff. And that didn't, you know, that was totally a white middle class thing. Oh, yeah. You know, um, for a long time, we had kind of some Ruby Payne stuff, you know. Don't, I don't know say people... that name. Okay. You, you <laughs> just gave me a remember. mild heart. You just, I don't know if we're going to be friends again. Like we might have to just end this right now because you said that name. <laughs> well, I mean, this is what's important about that is that like every decade has its Ruby Payne. Um, every decade has its pseudo, pseudo, pseudo scientific for people listening. Ruby Payne was the person that <laughs> made it. tens of millions of dollars tens of um, millions selling of to dollars. school districts, this, like this cheats, this cheat card of how to talk to people in poverty in schools. Like, so, so it was almost like, um, I've made this very tired and old reference a million times. If people remember the movie airplane, which a lot of you don't. So Google it. millennials. <laughs> Um, in the movie Airplane, the mother from Leave It to Beaver at one point, she she steps up on a plane and there's these two black guys talking and she's like, I speak jive. And then she starts yes. talking to them in what's supposed to be black language, black right. English. Um, that's how Ruby Payne was. It literally gave teachers a cheat sheet uh, on things like... Um, you know, rich people value um, um, intellect and poor people value humor. So use humor. <laughs> and uh, it was a way of miseducating teachers for at least 10 years, 10, 15, uh, 20 years possible. I, I took the her courses twice uh, for social work and <laughs> all the social workers that were black or of color stood up and walked out both times. Now imagine that had been being taught across many districts, right? So we have these, you know, <laughs> we have these miseducation uh, uh, devices going on in our schools. Um, but now what you're getting into, I think, is the better stuff. We're, we're coming out of that ice age of really kind of trendy, unscientific ways of looking at our kids. Yeah. I wonder if we're going to have a science movement, though, that catches on and says, practice, 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 practice. It's about practice. This is the best way to teach reading. This is the best way to teach math. This is the best way for teachers to collaborate. This is the best school science on how a school operates. You know. Well, I don't know if we're going to get to, you, you, you have to situate best within the context of the environment, right? So best in suburbia is not the mm -hmm. best in mm -hmm. the city, right? So, and that's not to say, 
either place is right or wrong. It is the, the context does not allow for a singularity of the best. There is a best. There is not a the best, right? And that, that's really important to sort of tease out and get to. Because um, when we talk about, like, Alfred Tatum talks about like rocks are available in every you know neighborhood. But the way I talk about rocks in say, you know, Minnesota where you live, are gonna, it's going to be different than the way that they talk about rocks where I live, right? The use of geology and, and geophysics, right, mm -hmm. is different by context. And so what we have to be get, we got to get to is the science of understanding contextual implementation. Wow. That's okay. important. That's a lot. That's a lot. Okay. Break like it down, Doc. Like that's the thing, right? <laughs> so like, when I understand my context, right? So let's just say there's something great going on in your child's school district that catches fire across the nation. All mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Yay for you. Love it. We cannot afford a plug and play perspective. What we have to do is understand why whatever that thing that worked in Chris's child school district worked. What can we extrapolate from it? Understand it within the context of our school system, our students, our economics, mm -hmm, our mm -hmm. framework, our paradigm. What can we take from it and then implement it according to our context so that the thing becomes a best in a larger way, but mm. in a way that is relevant and applicable to how we operate in our space. That's so that practice yeah. and context. Yes. So practice and context. That's right. Practice yeah. in its context. In its That's context. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Right? Um, because like, you know, they teach, you, you talk about teachers, right? I think Dr. Cole talked about it yesterday. A teacher might be good in one place. And then you say, oh, that's a great teacher. Then you yeah. pull them out of that place and put them someplace else and they bomb. That's right. That's right. Well, that's because you plugged and you played. You plug and yeah. play. That doesn't work. It yeah. doesn't work because that teacher may be out of his or her or their, you know, um, context. And they may, and, and it's okay to be good in certain places, yeah. right? And, and and have an affinity and have a, um, a real heart to teach in certain spaces. So kids deserve teachers who deeply, one, care about them. And know that. You no, know, um, one of the I think issues right now with this, because I think this is a, a super fine nuance and complex point that you're making. Um, and it leads me to believe that we always drive for scale. Like we want to scale that word. things up. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Like I hate that word. I, I've said often since on my school board days, I said often that like the one thing we scale up is failure. Mm -hmm. Like we do it over and over and again. Yeah. And and it's like the best ideas scale up to failure sometimes and, and people are befuddled. Mm -hmm. Like be, I think it's because we think of a, a franchise mentality. Like, that's right. you know, so we when, you, when you just yeah. said, like the, I had never heard it put that way, but like the pu plug and play thing or the turnkey operation is not going to mm -hmm. happen. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. We're but not, we want we're it to, though. Because it's expeditious. Yeah, yeah. It's an yeah. expeditious way. We are on this ROI mentality. We are in a business model mentality. There are certain aspects of a business mentality that work in schools and others that don't. Yeah, yeah. In the classroom, the business mentality does not work because you're dealing with human beings who are in development. Yeah. All right, like they're in they're in this sea of development. So you cannot just retrofit processes to kids who are in development, right? Yeah. It's not wow. the same thing. You can't do that. It's damaging to them because you're holding them to this hidden set of expectations they know nothing about. And kids yeah. will let you know. We know them. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're, and they're not dumb. They are They're not dumb. They know. Yeah. Yeah. They, they know. know. You know, and so um, this idea that we can just, you know, retrofit plug and play, pick it up. It's because we have a, there is the best and not an a uh, best. There's yeah. a best way here. Take from it, really deeply study it, understand the improvement mechanisms around and through it, and then see where it can be applied, mm -hmm. right? Take an, take an application, not just implementation framework to it. 
So as we come up to um, to our hour, to a time here, uh, final question for you. What is giving you hope? And, you know, like I'm about the good news. And we did in this. It's hard to escape talking about the bad news because you can't get to the good. Right. Until you understand what's preventing the good. But what is what are you looking at that um, that keeps you going in terms of we can do this? We can do this. Our kids can learn like they're we're going to make it. <laughs> well, I have a 20 month old grandson Ooh. <laughs> who, who is talking, is is like doing that, like writing thing with crayons and stuff like that, who is determined to let everyone know that he is here. And he's not to be, and he's not to be messed with. Uh, yes. Um, uh, he's an interesting study in what I think what our students are becoming. Mm -hmm. um, he mm -hmm. is. He has an understanding of literacy. Um, he has an understanding of communication, and he is being raised by two amazing people who are giving him space to understand his autonomous agents, agentive self. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's what give me, gives me hope is this notion of authentic agency in child development. Well, I just, on that point, it's very possible that my firstborn is watching this. And, you know, one thing that parents historically have appreciated is grandchildren. And if you are not, giving them grandchildren. Uh, uh, not, hint, hint, hint. <laughs> you're not following along with what the Bible says about honor thy father. Honor thy mother. That's right. You and their mother. That's right. So just a simple hint <laughs> for my firstborn. It's possible. It. Yeah. You it. know, it's possible that I'm of the age to want grandchildren at some point in my life. There you go. Um, there and there, there's, a, there, there's a message. Um, listen, I wanted to also um, uh, show the audience and you just two things that I think uh, kind of uh, epitomize a little bit of what I'm talking about here. So here's the first one. It's just a quick video I want to show. <laughs> We're not going to allow this pandemic to ruin the surprise for them, so we're taking it to each of their homes. I just so happened to, to be in your neighborhood. Y'all mind coming to the front door for me? So this is uh, just me saying that we want magic moments for our young people. This uh, is actually 25 black students being welcomed into an elite program at Harvard. Um, these are the stories that I live for. Many of us pass around social media posts that show a black student who was accepted to all the Ivy League or all the um, HBCUs. Um, and I love those stories because that's what we're shooting for. We're not shooting to continuously talk about what's not possible. Right. We're continuously looking to replicate the good news, the things that are working for our kids. Mm -hmm. I have one more that I'm just going to share my screen and share. This is uh, Maisha Taylor, who we're looking to have on this show um, soon at some point. Maisha's son um, is um, Ian. 
Uh, and Ian is 15 years old, and Ian um, is graduating from North or the University of North Texas with a bachelor's in science. Magna cum laude next week at age 15, he's graduating, wow. right? Total rock star. His sister, Haley, um, is has a show on, uh, on Citizen Ed. She's Gen Z talking to Gen Z on her show, and she's 16 years old in law school. Um, Maisha Taylor, who is his mom, grew up in South Central Los Angeles. Angeles, um, and you know, definitely not a silver spoon story. Um, she is a a doctor multiple times over, um, a medical doctor multiple times over, out of South Central Los Angeles, and took education into her own hands. Her kids were homeschooled, and she was not having it. She was not having mm -hmm. failure. She was not mm -hmm. having. You will not have my son. You will not have my daughter. This is the power of belief in what's possible when you can come out of South Central Los Angeles, become a medical doctor through hard work, and then raise your children I, uh, um, um, to be this successful. Both Haley and um, and Ian are doing great things. I should also mention at 15, uh, Ian is the um, CEO of a tech startup. <laughs> wow. Okay. I'm underachiever. I'm right. totally underachieving right now. Yeah, so we've made some, some wrong turns. Uh, and Clearly. the last thing I'll say about this is Maisha Taylor. Dr. Maisha Taylor, as I should say, is um, also the doctor that is the, um, she is the archetype. She is the person that Doc McStuffins is modeled after. Oh! <laughs> So get your mind around that. That's Doc McStuffins, yes. uh, for many of us who have, have a daughter and have kids of color, you have very few um, dolls or toys or things that represent, you know, achievement that you can buy for your kids. So Doc McStuffins, I don't know how y'all are, but we had lots of Doc McStuffins in this house um, <laughs> <laughs> because of that. And here it is. I meet the person who it's modeled uh, after. That's fabulous. So. Well, as Karen's book has said, it's being done. It's being, it's being done. done. It's being yeah. done. It is being done. That's not to say that it is easy. Um, education is rocket science. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It actually um, is. Turns out it is. Yeah. Well, rock, you can't have rocket science without, uh, um, you know, without education. Mm, and anyways, I, I want to say that uh, my firstborn, here's his, uh, his response to my call out for <laughs> grandchildren. Uh, nah, I'm good. Uh, this is why you, um, this is why your kids get better as you have more of them. Um, anyways, thank you so much, Dr. Reed Marshall. I appreciate it's a pleasure. you. Thank um, you so much. This for has the been invitation. a great, uh, hopefully you'll come back. Um, and if you're doing anything that you think is good for the show, um, your new podcast, when it comes back out, any books or written materials or studies, let me know. And we'll we will definitely that. highlight it here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Thank you so much, um, everybody Thank listening you. and watching. We appreciate you listening and watching. This has been an hour with Dr. Tanji Reed Marshall, who is in charge of, she's the director of the PK-12 uh, education at the Education Trust. Um, so if you want to Google Education Trust, you can find a lot of the information we talked about today. So I made mention of several things. And you can also find Dr. Reed Marshall there. Um, tomorrow we're going to have, um, I should highlight, uh, one of my spirit animals in the education world, and I, you know, I don't know if people get offended by spirit animal, but I'm just saying one of my heroes, Sheroes, is going to be on tomorrow. Uh, Katie Haycock uh, mm. uh, is the is my guest tomorrow um, for this show, and and oh, Katie wow. is the founder of, of the, the Education edge. Trust. I will be so, tuning in. Can't so, wait to see that one. That's going to be I fun. I appreciate you. Thank you so Absolutely much. 